Okay, when you look at fluctuations in the energy of the system, the usual definitions you should be able to do. Well, it can be written in terms of derivative with respect to beta, as I have discussed earlier. That gives us the following result, delta E squared average KB T squared del U del T and V plus KB T squared del U del N. Since this is heat capacity at constant volume, this is the earlier canonical result. That is the correction, grand canonical ensemble. Since I have already distributed the lecture notes to you, on this subject, you can see that this is exactly equal to delta E squared average canonical plus a correction term coming from the grand canonical ensemble fluctuating particle number. And the, the correction is related to fluctuations in the number of particles. So there is a connection because both are fluctuating. But we have shown for a specific example that this fluctuation is very small unless you are close to a phase transition, okay, that correction is quite small correction. So we have almost the previous canonical ensemble result, okay, where the fluctuations in energy is related to another response function heat capacity. What type of a response is that of your system? Why do I call it a response function? Because C is dQ dt, isn't it? dQ dt means when you give heat to the system, how is temperature is changing. It's a measure of change in temperature when you give heat to the system when you heat the system. Heating your system is possible because it is exchanging energy with the heat reservoir. Are these making any sense to you? It is quite reasonable, isn't it? Extremely important. These fluctuations are telling you quite a bit about the ensemble, corresponding ensemble, both canonical and grand canonical. Of course, nothing is happening in the microcanonical ensemble because it doesn't exchange energy and particle, particles with the rest of the universe. So it is an isolated system, no fluctuations. Any questions on this? If not, that's the end.
of chapter four, Grand Canonical Ensemble, discussion of Grand Canonical Ensemble. What do I do after, at the end of the chapter? Huh? I give the homework. <laughs> Before I start with the new discussion, let me give you your new homeworks. Homework number is in line with the chapter number. Now this next topic is quantum statistics. We have talked about the ensemble theory without mentioning anything quantum mechanical. Well, Hamiltonian, we did mention it in the form of energy, but wave function Operators for the physical quantities, operators. So let's talk about that quantum mechanical language. Talk about the system in the quantum mechanical language. Let's discuss the operators corresponding to our physical quantities and wave functions describing states and set up the whole thing, look at the ensemble theory from a quantum mechanical point of view. Quantum statistics, in other words. So. Well, let's define what is important as far as statistical mechanics is concerned. And the first thing that I will concentrate on is the density matrix. You'll see I will connect us to the concept of probabilities that we need for taking averages. And let us start by defining our system. Ensemble of, consider an ensemble of n identical systems, capital M, identical systems. All these systems will be characterized by the same Hamiltonian. These systems will have same Hamiltonian operators. When I put a head it will show the operator character of that quantity. So our systems will be described by the same Hamiltonian. We are going to consider a collection of these. At time t, the physical states of these systems will be characterized by a wave function. Physical states will be characterized by wave function psi ri t 
isn't it? That's what we do in quantum mechanics. And let, let's describe the wave function of the k system. Let's specify which system are we talking about. We have n of them, but let's concentrate on k system. And its wave function will be psi k r i t, physical state, k system will be in at time t. Okay? So, this k could be 1, 2, up to capital N. We have N systems in our ensemble. So everything is defined step by step. The time variation of this is going to be given by the Schrodinger equation, isn't it? Let me write in a shorthand function of time. So it is time dependent Schrodinger equation. So the K system at the state of the K system at time t, the psi of K, it satisfies this time dependent Schrodinger equation, isn't it? Now, usually what we do is to expand this wave function in terms of a complete set of basis functions. Okay? That's one of the standard assumptions of the quantum mechanics. We can expand our wave function in terms of any complete basis set. Okay, let's consider the complete set of already normalized orthonormal functions. Let's take them to be phi of n. Okay? We can expand our wave function in terms of phi n as follows. Psi for the k system can be written as a combination of these wave functions, okay? Of course, squares of these expansion coefficients will be giving us the probabilities of finding the system in the corresponding set basis, corresponding state. So I have to make a contact with the probabilities. That's what I will use. These expansion coefficients can be written as inverting the relationship when phi n star psi k d tau d tau is the volume element in coordinate space, isn't it? You can write it as d omega, whatever you like. But let's call it d tau. So you are multiplying this with phi star, 
and integrating, since these are all normalized, that will give, give you the expansion coefficient, isn't it? So, the physical state of the Kate system can also be described equal well with this expansion coefficient. It is a very specific thing. It, it is related to the state of the Kate system. So, let us use this. But first, let's look at the time variation of these wave functions, uh, the expansion coefficients. How do they vary in time? Let's check this quantity. Well, if you look at this, quite simple to see that this is nothing but the only thing that varies in time is this state function. It is this. Since I bar del del t is the Hamiltonian op operator, we can also write this as operators operating on k at time t, d tau, isn't it? And of course, we know what that is equal to because we know psi in terms of phi. That's right, that expansion here. dummy variable, we have to use a different one, a m k t, okay, so we end up with an equation which has matrix elements of Hamiltonian operator in terms of basis functions, isn't it? So let's rewrite that. As follows, that is equal to the sum H and M A M K T, isn't it? H and M is the matrix element of the Hamiltonian operator between N and M states, basis states. Matrix element. Okay? Or let's write that. Phi n star h phi m d tau. That's the matrix element. Well, since these a's are probability amplitudes, Amplitude, in the sense, square of this gives the probability, isn't it? Amplitudes for various systems in the ensemble to be in various states. Isn't it? 
the squares of these coefficients, expansion coefficients, are the probabilities of finding the system in the corresponding state, phi of n. Is that making sense? Okay. So, the probability is psi nk t squared. This is the probability. The probability that a measurement done in time t will find the system in the corresponding state. Okay? If these are probabilities, the sum over them should be equal to 1. That's the normalization condition. We can only have 100%. Now we are in a good position to describe the, define the density matrix in terms of these coefficients of expansion. So that will take us to the probabilities we need for taking averages. That's the statistical part. Let's define or introduce the density operator. Raw operator, function of time. Define it in terms of its matrix elements as follows. The matrix element of rho is 1 over the number of systems in your ensemble, sum over all the systems, from k from 1 to capital M, A, M, K, T, A, N, K, T star. That's the definition of density matrix. So, this is nothing but ense ensemble average of that what multiplication of two expansion coefficients. It should vary from member to member. That's why there's a dependence on the members of the ensemble. It's an average. What are the di uh, well, what are the diagonal elements of these metrics? And what are the non-diagonal elements? Diagonal elements will be the probabilities of finding the system because it will be, psi, for example, if m equals n, it is a n square, isn't it? Amplitude square. Those are the probabilities of finding the system in the corresponding state phi n. Huh? Non-diagonal elements, if m is not equal to n, is not actually the probabilities as we know them. But you can think of them as transition probabilities from one state to another. Isn't it? 
So that's the density matrix. You should be very familiar with it. It's extremely useful. For example, if you want to study nonlinear optics, that's what you use to calculate your transition probabilities and average optical properties of your system. Extremely important. Okay. With this definition, now we are going to be ready for investigating average values. But before that, I want you to prove this equation of motion for the density of matrix. Why don't you show, very easy to do, the following equation. This is like the quantum mechanical analog of the classical Liouville's theorem. Okay. Do this as homework. I'm not going to collect. Now, looking at this, then, if the given system is known to be in equilibrium, no changes, then, of course, the rate of change of the density matrix elements will be zero. And the, that is time independent. And the commutation relation will be zero with the Hamiltonian, OK? If the Hamiltonian is not depending on time explicitly, that commutator will be 0, 2. The, the derivative will be 0 of h. If you take phi n to be a specific set, let's Write this down, it's extremely important. Energy representation, if you choose a representation, if phi n basis functions, eigenfunctions of Hamiltonian, then both h and rho must be diagonal. In this basis, then. This is the so-called energy representation. So rho mn will be rho n delta n n and h and n matrix elements are diagonal.
rho must be symmetric. You should go back to your quantum mechanics. Psi is expanded in basis functions. Rho can be written as in terms of basis Bn squared by n so that the matrix element is phi m rho phi n can be written as phi m rho phi n using that rho you can write this as k Phi M Phi K B K squared Phi K Phi M So it is Delta M N B N squared or Delta M N Row n, if you like. And it must be symmetric. Row must be symmetric. Now, defining the density matrix like this must give us the averages, averages of operators, because physical quantities in quantum mechanics are represented as operators. Let's look at these average values. Physical quantity. Let's take it to be represented by this operator. Its average value then is 1 over the number of systems in your ensemble, k from 1 to n. Psi k star operators psi k b tau isn't it what do you call this in quantum mechanics expectation value isn't it so if you expand these two functions in terms of bases, in terms of a n, you can rewrite this as two wave functions, both of them should be expanded. A n k star a m k matrix element of the operator between states n m okay one of the expansion coefficients should be a machine conjugated complex conjugated in some sense so it is corresponding to this wave function. 
and the matrix element of the operator is nothing but phi n stars the operator and phi m the power. Okay. Now let's introduce our density matrix. Now we are at that point. We have the expansion coefficients multiplying each other. In terms of the density matrix, expectation value of the operator A uh, o is nothing but the sum m n rho m n operator matrix element n m. Here it is. It comes naturally to the expectation value, the average value of that operator in statistical terms as matrix elements of the operator summed over and multiplied by the density matrix. That's the important thing. You can also write this as a single sum, if you like, multiplying two This is matrix multiplication of two matrices, density matrix and the matrix corresponding to your operator. Oh, that's a sum over the diagonal elements. What is that in quantum mechanics? Sum over the diagonal elements. Trace. How do you forget this? Trace, so the average value, the expectation value is nothing but trace of density matrix operator and the operators corresponding to your physical system, physical property. If you take the operator to be unit operator, if the operator is taken to be a unit operator, then trace of rho comes out to be equal to 1. Well, trace diagonal elements are probabilities. When you add up the probabilities, it must be 1. extremely important. So you are dis discovering the properties of the density matrix and that's the quantity you should learn to relate everything to statistical mechanics. So, taking everything quantum mechanically as you are used to. Okay. You can also write the expectation value, the average value, in terms of traces. So, if original wave function not normalized, the expectation value should be trace of rho and operator in question times trace rho. Otherwise, 
It is just trace rho times the operator. Now, why is trace important? Do you remember? What is the most important property of trace? Well, it <laughs> must be important. It is important because it is representation independent. Well, here is the proof. Trace AB is equal to trace BA. So that trace S a as inverse to change from one representation to another. Trace as inverse as A, that is equal to trace A. So the average is representation independent. Extremely important. Now, we have to discuss the form of rho, the density matrix, in different ensembles. What is it for microcanonical, canonical, and grand canonical ensemble? So, to be able to do statistics of various ensembles, we should know the form of rho in all these different ensembles. Let's start with microcanonical, since we are doing quantum statistics. Do we have any questions up to now? Is everything clear? Any questions? Okay. Let's look at the microcanonical ensemble. Systems in this ensemble are having the following property. Number of particles is a constant. Volume is a constant. And energy is also constant. But since physically we cannot keep it at a single value, we define it in a small range showing that it is only in that range. Well, in the interval E minus 1 half delta, E plus 1 half delta, so we know energy within delta. Okay, that's from an experimental point of view, more reasonable to fixed energy. It is, if delta is very small, it is fixed, more or less constant. Total number of microstates available to the system is omega within that energy within that interval, okay? And these microstates with that total number are equally probable, isn't it? It is equally probable to find a system in any one of these microstates. 
equally probable. This is postulate of equal a priori probabilities. We have discussed this at the first lecture, set of lectures. The density matrix in this ensemble will have this following form. Rho and N will be diagonal and element, diagonal elements will correspond to probabilities. Well, probability of finding it in any one of these states will be inversely proportional to the total number of states, microstates available for each accessible state. And I gave you a simple example of what an accessible state is, the meaning of accessible state. Zero for all other states. And of course, the contact with thermodynamics was established by logarithm of that number very much the thing that we have done before. Is that okay? Do we have any questions? Anything? Ask something. Okay, thank you. Let's give it some more break.